plan to continue on with the Romans today. We're we'll going to make some good progress this year and <laughs> uh, I, I thought I would get verses 6 through 11 of chapter 2 today with the Lord. I couldn't get the lead on verses 7 through 11, so we're just going to look at verse 6 today. We're still talking about the judgment of God here. Speaking on God and his judgment, in verse 6, Paul writes, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? Amen. So it's, this is referring to God and his judgment, and he will says he will render every, to every man according to his deeds. That God is going to, you might could say, reward or give or pay every man according to his deeds. Mm -hmm. We can turn over to Matthew chapter 16. I want to look at several scriptures today. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. When one place Christ said that the Father wouldn't judge, but he'd given judgment to the Son. And here he says, For the Son of Man shall come in his glory, or in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Amen. God, through the person of Christ, when he returns, he's just, he says he's going to reward every man according to his works. You know, I know the, the works for salvation people are probably thinking, well, i got to do enough good works and I'll get a good reward. But that's, that's really not what Christ or Paul is saying here. Right. But we can be sure we will get rewards according to our works. Amen. But it won't be the same for the saved as it is for the unsaved. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but we will be judged differently than those who don't profess Christ. You're right. Those who truly have never been born again, they will face a different type of judgment than the saved. Yeah. But you can be sure every one of us is going to be rewarded according to our works. Amen. Like going back to our, our text here in Romans 2, he says, who will render to every man. Well, that doesn't leave out any person, does it? Amen. We can't think that just because we are saved that we are outside of the judgment of God. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Even here, Solomon knew that none would be outside of the judgment of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse number 17. Here he says, I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Amen. We can identify as the righteous in Christ, but he will judge us just the same as he will judge the wicked. But right. We will, he said, there's a time for every purpose and for every work. There is a time for each of these judgments as well. As, we, as Christ said, when he returned with his holy angels, then he will judge. There are, is this judgment for us and judgment for the, the unsaved? And some think they're happening at the same time, some think they happen at different times. I, I don't know that I know enough about what's going to transpire to know, but I do believe it will happen. We will have a separate one than the unsaved. Right, right, amen. But either which way, we all will stand before God at some point, and we will all be judged according right. to our works. So, not to get ahead of ourselves again, but this is not for salvation. We turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll see. <coughs> Here Paul is speaking on 
the judgment that the saved will face. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Amen. Here is the judgment for the saved. We will stand before God and we will receive rewards or lack of rewards, right, for the deeds that we've done in this body. But we can thank God in Romans chapter 8, verse 1 tells us that there is therefore now no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. we, will, we will not stand condemned before God if we are truly born again, but we will still give an account, as he says here, that we may receive the things done in this body. And it's not just going to be all you know, lollipops and stickers and pats on the back. Right. Oh, he says, whether it be good or bad. <laughs> but we will have to stand before him and we will have to answer for the sins which we've done in this body. But we can thank God if we've truly been saved that we don't have to, we won't be condemned before him. We can plead the blood of Christ. And that doesn't mean there won't be probably lots of weeping on our parts there. Right. Well, we, we don't have to turn there, but if we go over to Revelation 20 and the great white throne judgment, we see again all the dead, small and great, stand before God. Right. And death and hell deliver up the devil for them, in them, the grave see there are none that will escape that judgment and I believe that's the judgment of the unsaved mm -hmm. and it says there that every one of them shall be judged according to their works here we go the problem is they will not be sufficient for the unsaved will they? amen they will not be able to stand before God and say here look at my good works and be accepted before him mm -hmm. So this is not for salvation, but for the saved, it is our account of our deeds done in this body. For the unsaved, it is to their condemnation. Mm -hmm. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 7 and we'll see just one example of how our works cannot save us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 through 23. This is speaking of that judgment. Verse 22 of Matthew 7, Christ says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Right. I don't know if there's any sadder words that will ever be spoken. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Mm. Yeah, we see it doesn't matter if you're the you know, pastor, Sunday school teacher, song leader, a good church member. All these things that we can do will not be sufficient if we don't know Christ to save you. Uh, these, they prophesy, they cast out devils. None of us think have done that. It says they've done many wonderful works. And yet they didn't know Christ. They've never truly been born again. Well, I, I don't know how many in the Lord's churches are truly saved and how many are deceived, but I can be sure that from my own witness that I've seen, not everyone that professes the name of Christ is truly born again. You're right. If we're not careful, we'll say, well, look at me and look what I am doing. Yeah. And certainly we ought to be serving God. That's later in our lesson here, but we should not be trusting in those things. Mm. Amen. We cannot expect to stand before God and say, for Brother Larry, yes, I was the pastor for a number of years. Yes, I faithfully preached the gospel. Yes, I talked. Yes, I led the singing. Yes, I did this or did that. <clears throat> yes, I was a faithful church member. None of those things will be worthy for salvation when we stand before God. You're right. 
See, even these who had done many good works, yet because they had not been truly born again, it was not sufficient for them. Amen. They were found lacking, just like all those who trust in their works today will find their works are quite lacking when they stand before God. So at that great white throne, they stand before Him and are judged according to their works. They'll find that all their good works were as filthy rags, as Isaiah says. Mm -hmm. Why well, often? I often use the illustration that we've had all our good works in one hand on a scale and all our bad works on this hand. And all our bad works would always outweigh our good works anyway. You're right, amen. But really, because of our sinful nature, all our good works are tanned by sin and are on the bad side anyway. Amen. Outside of Christ, we can do nothing that is truly acceptable in the sight of God. Amen. Yeah, we have countless millions and millions today that are hoping they'll be a good enough person or hoping their good works are going to outweigh their bad works. Well, they hope they're good. According to the fairy tale they've heard, stand before the Peter at the pearly gates and mm -hmm. he's going to let them in. And hold the deal you'll be like Lazarus and carried by the angels or you'll be as a rich man and open your eyes in hell. There you go. Mm -hmm. Then one day you'll stand before God and give an account to him. The difference will be, can you plead that Christ is your mediator, that the blood has been applied to you, or will you stand there in your own filthy self-righteousness and not have anything to cling to? Right. Let's we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3. Was that a familiar verse? Two verses, Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9. This is the difference between the, the truly born again and those who are trusting in their own selves. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. Here Paul writes, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. And he had just been listing all the things he could boast about in the flesh. That, how he was a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. How he was the ideal Jew. Mm -hmm. In the Jews' religion, he was as good as he could get. But yet, before God, none of those things counted for anything. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things the loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, but, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. That is the only righteousness that we can claim when we stand before God. Is mm -hmm. The righteousness which is through faith. Righteousness which is really Christ's righteousness applied to our account. We can be a good sound Baptist. We can be a good faithful church member. We can do lots of good things, but our own righteousness will be insufficient when we stand before God. Amen. As why Paul said he didn't want to be found having his own righteousness. He knew that it wasn't enough. Which is really shows that he had experienced the grace of God because that's all he trusted in before the Lord saved him. Mm -hmm. He had a great zeal for his religion, but it wasn't the right zeal. It wasn't a zeal according to knowledge, he says. Mm -hmm. Well, going back to verse 6, it says, Touching the righteous was in the law blameless. Well, he was a very, quote, good person in the law's eye. Yet, even that was insufficient. Even that was, when you see who you are by the grace of God, you realize that is not enough. No matter how good a person you may have been before the Lord saved you, it takes the righteousness of Christ, which is by faith. Amen. Well, I think we have many people who do a lot of charitable works in the world. Mother Teresa is one that's often looked upon, but from her own testimony, she's never truly been born again. Those good works are not going to be able to save her when she stands before God. You're right. Well, 
but let's not think that for the sake that this is some sort of get out of jail free card. Amen. Turn back to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Here's a verse I've been referencing a few times already. It says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen. Back at verse 10, he says, At the end of that, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all stand before him, even to say, give an account for this life. Sometimes I don't know that we think on that enough, or we give that enough thought that we will have to stand before him and give an account for what we've done in this life. Right. So we can thank him that there's no condemnation in this, if we're truly saved, but yet, grace is not a license to sin. Grace is not give us a right to just live how we want to. That's right. Well, again, we'll see this later on in the book of Romans where he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall Amen. we better dead to sin living longer therein? We are called by the grace of God to live our lives unto, unto Christ. And we will give an account for that one day. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 after he tells that it's for my grace are we saved through faith and not ourselves. It is the gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. He says, For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus under good works, and God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. We saved us that we might have these good works, that we might bear this good fruit. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 tells us that. The grace of God, which brings salvation and fear to all men, teaching us to live godly, soberly, righteously in this present world. He didn't just save us and say, okay, do what you want to. And we have great liberty in Christ, but yet we're supposed to use that liberty to serve Him and serve others. Amen. So, 1 Corinthians 3, and we'll bring this to a close for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> I've heard this taught on several times, but I think sometimes we miss the point here. This is for the saved. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 through 15 says, For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You bad. Yeah, that is the foundation on which we have to start upon. Any other foundation is not going to stand. Any other foundation is like building upon the sand. And it might stand for a little while, but as soon as the storms come, the waves beat and so it's going to fall. Right. Yeah. Christ must be the foundation, or otherwise the whole building is compromised. But we're told to build thereon in the next verse. You know, go back to verse 10. He says, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Well, Christ is that foundation, but we need to take heed how we build upon that foundation. Verse number 12 says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Right. We, we that are saved, we have this foundation which is Christ. But what we build upon it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. you know, are we building things for the kingdom of God? Are we building upon it things which are glorifying the Christ, edifying the saints? Are we building upon the things of this world, things that are going to be burned up one day? Right. Notice verse 14, he says, For if, any, me, if any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what we build upon there is going to be tried one day. He said that with this fire. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're building, is it going to last and stand 
in this fire or is it going to be burnt up? He says if what we build survives the fire, we're going to receive a reward. If our work is burnt up, he says we shall suffer loss, but yet we'll still be saved so as by fire. Mm -hmm. See, the foundation can't be burnt up. The foundation is Christ. Yet, is that all we're going to have when we stand before him? Is that all we're going to have to say, you know, still got the foundation, Lord. Or we're we going to have these works that we can, that will be tried and stand in the fire. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid many, many Christians of our time, at least, are going to suffer loss and be saved yet so as by fire. Right. But it should never, that should never be our desire to get by with the bare minimum. It shouldn't. It should be our desire that we could have these works that we can get this reward. And I think these rewards will be able to cast back at Christ and say, "Thou art worthy." Amen. You know, it's not that we're going to be walking around with golden scepters and crowns and say, "Look at me," but these rewards we can say we can cast back at the feet of Christ and mm -hmm. worship Him for all eternity. Amen. Yeah, if we're not careful, we'll build upon that foundation things which don't matter. And they'll be burnt up, and we won't have anything but Christ Himself left. We ought to be careful how we're building upon that foundation which Christ is, which is Christ. So that we can't lose our salvation, but we can certainly lose all the rewards. Amen. But well, if your foundation isn't Christ, it's, it's all it's all going to be burned up and you'll have nothing but your own filthy righteousness to, to stand before God. And as I pointed out, that will not be enough. Amen. Then you shall say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. you know, I don't know what our place will be as a saved at that point, but I can imagine it will be. If we were still in the flesh, it would be a very sorrowful sight. Mm -hmm. Be a God will get the glory out of the judgment of both the saved and the unsaved. Right. When he cast away sin forever, and death and hell are cast in the lake of fire, and all those that are the enemies of Christ, and God will be glorified even in that. Go, mm -hmm. so let us be busy about the work we've been called to do. Let's be busy building upon this foundation and pointing others to Christ that they might have the same foundation. Mm -hmm. It is true that every man will receive according to his works, but will your works be in Christ or will your works be of your own filthy doing? That's what make, will make a difference when we stand before God. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead and close with that thought, Lord. One, we'll look more next week. At, Paul gives these two groups here in the verses seven and eight, and nine, ten, eleven. We're going to look at those next week. Amen. <laughs>